morning, good afternoon, and good evening, hockey fans. It is a not terrible 9 degrees Celsius, 49 degrees Fahrenheit in overcast Bridgewater, Nova Scotia today. My name is Justin, Bridgewater's finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and welcome to the Tuesday, April 26th edition of the Bridgewater's Finest 2016 NHL Playoffs podcast. Now, we had a pair of games go down last night, Game 6 between Anaheim and Nashville, and the pivotal Game 7 between Chicago and St. Louis. But before we talk about those two games, I just want to take a second to talk about the NHL's personal vendetta against me, and subsequently what that means for scheduling over the next couple of days. So because the NHL scheduling department is dumber than a box of rocks and have the final game of round one taking place on the same day as the first game of round two, or vice versa, depending on which way you want to look at it, here's how scheduling is going to go down for the next couple of days. Today's episode, we're going to do reviews of the two games that happened last night. And I'm going to give you my sort of Eastern Conference wrap-up. We're just going to take a couple of minutes at the end of the episode to wrap up the Eastern Conference, talk just a little bit about what I thought about each series, and so on. Tomorrow's episode is going to be my full-scale round two predictions. But Justin, you might ask, how can you do round two predictions when you don't know one of the teams? Great question, Skip. The NHL is fucking me over. I just want to make this crystal clear in case it's ambiguous to anybody. It is stupid to have the last game of the first round be on the same day as the first game of the second round. Finish your first round and then move on. It's just annoying to me that every year there's something stupid that goes on with the scheduling of these playoffs. There's always something. It's every year and it makes my quote unquote job makes it, it does make it more difficult, like trying to make predictions and makes the media's job, quote unquote, more difficult because they don't really know how to go with it. So what I'm going to end up doing when I do my round two predictions tomorrow is I'm going to do a prediction based on if Anaheim wins game seven, and I'm going to do a prediction based on if Nashville wins game seven. And whoever happens to win game seven, I'm going to hold myself to that prediction. But Justin, you might ask, what happens if Frederick Anderson gets run into and breaks his leg with five seconds left in the game and Anaheim wins? Won't that change your prediction? It sure will, Skip. And once again, this is why it's a stupid fucking decision. I'm cursing more in this episode than I've cursed, I think, in the entirety of the podcast up until now. I would have much rather had these two teams overnight... Last night from Nashville to Anaheim and play game seven tonight than I would giving them that extra travel day off and then the decision being made in someone's infinite wisdom to have game one of I think the Islanders and Lightning take place tomorrow night alongside game seven the final game of the first round. I would much rather have had them overnight and play that game tonight than to do it the way the NHL has chosen in their infinite wisdom to do it. But in any case, we'll get through it. So today, we're going to review the two games from last night and wrap up the first round of the Eastern Conference. Tomorrow, full-scale round two predictions coinciding with the two games that we will tee up for Wednesday night's action. Get it? Got it? Good. Let's get into the games that they played last night. So we're going to get started in Nashville with the Predators hosting the Ducks for Game 6 of their series. Uh, Anaheim went into this game leading the series three games to two. This series going to seven games. Nashville beats Anaheim 3-1 on home ice. Each home team has now won a game in this series, finally. Shots in the series, sorry, shots in the game, rather. 27-26 to in favor of the Ducks. Series now tied at three games apiece. Both of the teams taking early penalties in this one in the first, and really just one shot on each power play and that to me indicates nerves like this was a very obviously nervous energy in the building the home team could get eliminated just some nerves on the ice nervous energy 
basically. But those were two not great power plays to start the game. Nashville definitely takes the early lead in terms of blocking opposition shots. So Anaheim is getting more pucks towards the net. Nashville doing a great job getting down, blocking those shots. Frederick Anderson, though, does make the game's first big save. Ryan Ellis one-timer early in the first period. Anderson had to be very sharp, sharp, and he turns that away. Anaheim is the first team to open up the game physically, but Nashville, in turn, generate off of Anaheim's physicality. So, again, kind of a kind of the reverse of what we've seen through most of these playoffs. Anderson has to come up big. Another save on Ryan Ellis. Ellis getting the chances. Anderson equal to the task. The Ducks start taking this thing over late first period, controlling the faceoff dot as they've done so well throughout this entire series. They generate three shots late in the first period off of some victorious faceoffs. And the early second really goes much the same. There's chances both ways. Pekka Rinne this time has to come up big, making his first really, really strong save of the game on a shot from uh, Simone Dupre. The Preds fire three quality shots in a nine-second span in the middle of the second period. We're talking about guys Forsberg, Weber, Yossi, dangerous shooters for the Predators. The Predators just keep it going. They just keep, they don't let that momentum slip away. And eight minutes and ten seconds into the second period, the scoring has been opened. Nashville gets on the board first. It's Eckholm with his second of these playoffs. Jar- uh, Yarncroc, I think is how you pronounce his last name, or Jarncroc, but I think it's Yarncroc, or Yarncroak, or whatever. J-A-R-N-K-R-O-K. Yarncroc and Ellis with the assists. Uh, Eckholm kind of circles the net and puts a wrister on, and it beats Frederick Anderson, who I believe was screened on the play. Probably didn't see the puck great. Eckholm's got his second of the playoffs. Nashville is up 1-0. The Predators maintaining their pressure. That was kind of the Preds' MO in this game. They got pressure, but they were able to hold on and keep it. So the Predators keeping pressure after that goal. They register the next six shot attempts after the 1-0 goal. So they definitely were keeping the pressure on the Ducks, which is how you have to play if you're about to get eliminated. The Ducks start a mid-second period pushback. They're throwing some hits. The four-check pressure by Anaheim was unbelievable. Unfortunately, they kind of get caught on one. Corey Perry throws a shot at the net, misses wide, and the Preds immediately turn it around in transition. 17.45 into the second period, Nashville has doubled their lead. It's 2-0. James Neal with his second of these playoffs. Johansson with the assist. Nice little two-on-one, Neal and Johansson. Saucer pass across, and Neal basically has an open net. He buries it behind Frederick Anderson. It is 2-0. The home crowd is way into this one. The Preds, however, cannot escape the second period unscathed. Uh, Eckholm gets caught with a holding penalty on Hampus Lindholm. The Ducks' power play goes to very quick work. I think they were only on the power play for about 20 seconds or so. But just over two minutes from the 2-0 goal, Anaheim on the power play gets back within one. It's Ryan Kessler. It's his third of these playoffs. Perry and Fowler drawing the assist. They hold the puck in at the line. I can't remember if it was Fowler or Perry. I think it was Fowler. A point shot comes through. I think, though, that was from Corey Perry. The puck's just laying there in the crease. Kessler dives. It looks like he gets like cross-checked into the post, which looked a little scary. But he goes to the net, crashes. He finds the puck in the crease. It's in the net. Anaheim gets within one. Both teams now selling out to keep pucks away from their net in the third period. Really no momentum swings here either way. The Ducks, though, missing the net on three straight shot attempts in the span of about 43 seconds. That's a little bit of a push, but it's a push that's not generating a whole hell of a lot. Their best chance comes at 13-20 of the third period. We're skipping ahead a little bit. Anaheim cycling the puck to Corey Perry, wide open in the slot. How does Corey Perry get that open in the slot? Unreal. Pekka Rene equal to the task. He stones Perry on the doorstep. Honestly, I thought Perry had a little bit more room here. He could have made a move. I feel like he shot it just a little too early, but I think he could have made a move. He didn't. Pekka Rene makes the save. Frederick Anderson then comes up big. A Colin Wilson backhander. Kind of almost the same play with Perry where the puck is just floated to the slot and all of a sudden Colin Wilson is all alone 
Now, obviously, Corey Perry's a more dangerous sniper than Colin Wilson is, but Wilson is still all alone, just him and the goaltender. Wilson puts a backhander on net. Frederick Anderson comes up big. Anaheim pulls the goaltender. Nashville blocking two shots very late in the third period, which leads to 19 minutes and 50 seconds into the third, just 10 seconds left in the game. Nashville ices it with an empty netter. Shea Weber from about three quarters of the way down the opposite end of the ice. Weber with his second goal of these playoffs. James Neal draws the assist. And there you go. 3-1 Nashville. They win game six convincingly. They out hit the Ducks by a 30 to 25 so it wasn't ridiculous but they out hit them and they out blocked them they almost doubled them up in shot blocks 21 to 11 game 7 goes Wednesday the Preds earned it going back to Anaheim the other game last night of course was your main event of the evening the Chicago Blackhawks in St. Louis for game 7 to take on the Blues the series obviously tied up 3 games apiece Chicago falls to the St. Louis Blues. The Blues show their grit. They get early support. They lose the lead, but they don't give up on it. They win the game 3-2 to two in front of the home crowd. They win the series four games to three. Now, I actually don't have the proper shot total on my notepad here. I still have the shots from the last Minnesota and Dallas game. So I'm just going to pull up NHL.com here. Shots were 33 to 26 in favor of the Blackhawks. Notable, the Blues severely outhit the Blackhawks in this game, 34 to 19. They outblocked them 20 to 11. Uh, Blues did have five giveaways, but not a ridiculous number there. The Blues get the win. And would you expect anything other than an early goal? Uh, With the way these playoffs have gone, you got to expect a goal in the first minute. They did one better. Exactly one minute. One minute and zero seconds into the first period. St. Louis gets on the board. It's Jory Laterra, Bomeister and Schwartz drawing the assists. Laterra with a beautiful tip off the Bomeister point shot. Corey Crawford had no chance on that one. St. Louis in front of the home crowd really gets them into it. They are on the board in the first minute of the game. Much like in the Nashville-Anaheim game, after the first goal, the Blues maintain momentum they're getting the better of the play certainly getting the better of the physical game after that first goal but you're starting to see some desperation now out of both teams both teams with their backs against the wall tons of blocked shots on both ways the chances however eventually do come it opens up a little bit more middle of the first period and 13:43 into the first, St. Louis has doubled their lead. St. Albert, Alberta's own Colton Pareko. I talked about him on Facebook a couple of days ago. He's a guy that you can definitely get behind in these playoffs. Pareko with his second goal of the playoffs. Berglund and Steen picking up the assists. A point one timer. Berglund puts it across to Pareko. He's got a booming shot. And it's a bit of a knuckler because it's, it's kind of going end over end. It beats Corey Crawford. It is 2 nothing Blues. Chicago, to their credit, they definitely don't crumble. They have been here before. They step up their play after that 2 nothing goal, improving the quality of their chances and the frequency of their chances. Brian Elliott has to come up with a big save on a Patrick Kane one-timer. But 18.30 into the first period, just a minute and a half left, Chicago cuts the deficit to one. It's Marion Hosa with his third of the playoffs. Richard Ponick drawing the assist. I talked about Richard Ponick. He had himself a game. He had himself a series. Richard Ponick, uh, just uh, an unsung sort of, except by me, hero for the Blackhawks here. Again, in transition, Hosa gets the puck, a nice cross-ice feed from Ponick, you know, a third of the length of the ice. Hosa just walks in and slaps it home. He's just like... It was one of those things where Hosa, he's such a talented player, he can kind of take a game on his back and say, okay, no more 2 nothing. I would rather it be 2-1, and then he just does it. So that's the talent and ability of Marion Hosa. It is now 2-1 St. Louis. Brian Elliott forced to make another big stop on another Hosa chance late in the first period. That could have been a huge momentum swing. Chicago keeps pushing here to open the second period. Kevin Shattenkirk takes a holding penalty on Kruger, and you know where I'm going with this. 3.20 into the second period, 
Chicago ties the game on the man advantage. It's Andrew Shaw with his fourth goal of these playoffs. He had himself a series. Taves and Keith, the big guys, picking up the assists on the goal. They cycle the puck in down low, and really it just takes a bad bounce. Shaw's trying to throw it across the crease to an open man. I can't remember who was there. I think it was Taves. But he's trying to throw the puck across, just takes a bad bounce off of Elliott. It's a tough goal, and it's one of those goals where you look at it and you're like, oh no, here we go. Like, that's what's going to break St. Louis's back. The criticism against the Blues is that they're not mentally tough in situations like this. So you see a goal like that and you think, okay, that's it, here we go, that's what's going to happen. But... To St. Louis's credit, the play evens out after that goal. There's chances going both ways. Corey Crawford absolutely stoning young Robbie Fabry on a nice tic-tac-toe play by the Blues. Fabry with the shot, Crawford with the save. Brian Elliott, after giving up that goal, equal to the task, a beautiful sliding pad save on another one-timer from Patrick Kane. Kane had multiple opportunities in this game to be the hero, like he was in Game 5. Didn't happen on either of those. Brian Elliott played a hell of a game. The defense starts loosening up a bit in the mid-second. The chances are amping up. Corey Crawford forced to make five consecutive saves and none of them were super easy. Crawford keeping his team in it. Runblad, unfortunately, taking a slashing penalty to open the third period, slashing Kyle Brodziak. It's an unnecessary frigging penalty. It definitely hurts. St. Louis power play, no damage on the power play, but soon after. 8.31 into the third period, St. Louis breaks the deadlock. It's Troy Brower, former Blackhawk Troy Brower, first goal of these playoffs. Fabry and Stastny picking up the assists. St. Louis now up 3-2. A nice, again, tic-tac-toe passing. Brower picking up the rebound. He slides it home and... Brower just snake bites his former team. It was it, you couldn't write a better story than that. Troy Brower puts the Blues on top at home. Richard Ponick, as good as I have been mentioning that he's been in this series, unfortunately takes an interference penalty on Patrick Berglund shortly after that 3-2 goal. That's two minutes killed. They killed off the penalty, but that's two minutes on the game clock killed when you're in desperation mode. You need all the time you can get. That's basically two minutes off the clock. But starting at 12-14 of the third period, Chicago throwing six shots towards the net, four uh, four more get blocked, so there's ten attempts, and two very critical misses that were very, very close. Puck control was key for St. Louis late in this game, fending off the push. Five of the final eight face-offs in this game were won by St. Louis. They had the edge there. Colton Pareko with a big block on a Brent Seabrook shot. Alex Petrangelo with a big block on the Richard Ponick shot. Ponick trying to make up for taking that penalty. And then, of course, the play of the game. Brent Seabrook shot from the point. It hits both posts and stays out. They would review it to make sure it didn't cross the line. It did not. And St. Louis shuts the game down in the last minute and a half. They pulled Corey Crawford, but they shut this thing down. I think one shot might have gotten through to the net in the last minute and a half. The Blues get it done. And I was super impressed with the mental fortitude of this Blues team. They pulled themselves up over the hump. I feel great for David Backus, who has been there for a decade. And had they not won this game, might probably have lost the captaincy. There could have been a lot of explosion I think if St. Louis had not have won this game they made an excellent point on Hockey Night in Canada Chicago losing this game and thereby losing this series does not diminish them in any way they're still Chicago and they're still a dynasty St. Louis had they lost this game I mean that whole front office could have been blown up uh Bacchus probably would have lost the C uh Tarasenko with the way he's been acting with Ken Hitchcock maybe could have requested a trade like who knows there could have been huge rippling effects for St. Louis they do not lose this game they get it done Blues are moving on over Chicago big win for them what a series and the Blues earned it 
Okay, folks, as promised, we're going to close out today's episode with just a quick wrap-up of the Eastern Conference matchups. The Eastern Conference matchups are in the books. There's just the one matchup in the West still to be determined. So in the Eastern Conference, we'll start with Washington and Philly. Washington wins this series in six games. That was a perfect prediction for yours truly. I said it was going to be Washington in six. It was Washington in six. Not quite the way I thought the series would go. Obviously, with the Caps jumping out to what seemed like an insurmountable three games to none lead, Philly makes a goaltending change, and they just come back and win the next two games and put pressure on the Caps. Maybe I should have seen it coming with the Caps, you know, sort of notorious inability to close out series, but, I mean, to their credit, they got it done. They got it done when they needed to. Uh, We'll take a look at the Capitals here. Let's see. I mean... Honestly, the Caps probably had the best opening round series. Certainly defensively, I mean, they only gave up six goals in uh, in six games. So, I mean, Braden Holpe definitely getting it done there. Um, You know, they only scored 14 goals. And the vast majority of that, obviously, was in the first... uh, was in the first part of this series where they just feasted on Steve Mason. Um, I mean, honestly, they had a great series. They really never felt like they were in doubt here in terms of, oh, geez, I wonder if they're actually going to win this series. It really didn't feel like it was in doubt at all. Capitals currently ranking third in the NHL in terms of the power play, 29.6%. That's definitely good enough to get it done. They trail only Pittsburgh and Chicago, who is now eliminated. They were also 95.8% on the penalty kill, second only to Tampa Bay, whose penalty kill dominated the Red Wings in the first round. Caps generated 31 shots a game. They only gave up 25.8. That's definitely good enough to get it done. Uh, now, they weren't the greatest in the faceoff dot. They were losing more faceoffs than they won, but, you know, it can't be perfect, right? So, honestly, Caps had a really good series. Um, it went just about the way that I thought it would in terms of number of games. I knew Philly was going to be a battle, but Caps win it in six. Perfect prediction for me. I'm 1 0. So moving on, we're going to look at Pittsburgh and the Rangers. I took Pittsburgh originally to win this series in seven games. They wrap it up in five. Was probably the most impressive, I guess, I would have to say. Most impressive performance of the first round would be the way that Pittsburgh just utterly dominated a great team in the New York Rangers. The Penguins are tied for the most goals scored in these playoffs so far. 21, they're tied with Dallas. They are ahead of only Chicago, Chicago by only one, but of course Chicago's gone, ahead of St. Louis by two. Now, they scored those 21 goals in just five games where the Stars took six, so they're leading the way in terms of goals scored per game at 4.2. That's unbelievable. They have the best power play in these playoffs, 38.1%. They were generating only about as many shots as they were giving up to the Rangers, so it's not like the Rangers didn't have opportunities, and the Rangers were winning face-offs quite a bit more often, actually, than the Penguins were. That was actually a significant advantage for the Rangers in this series. I think what really let the Rangers down, I mean, honestly, was Henrik Lundqvist, and I don't mean to speak ill of the King, because that can get you beheaded. I understand, like, he's been carrying this team for so long. He really has, but... You know, you you still gotta. What if it's not? I feel like such a jerk for saying this, but it's a. It, it becomes sort of a "What have you done for me lately?" kind of thing where you can get get us there, great. But when you get us into the playoffs, you gotta perform when they're there too. So I mean, it it had to be an injury thing. After he took that high stick from his own player, I mean, he wasn't the same goaltender. There's just there's no getting around it. He wasn't the same goaltender, but Pittsburgh showed their grit. Pittsburgh just such a powerful team. That Phil Kessel trade is now really starting to look good because playoff Phil Kessel, as Steve Dangle has mentioned in his Eastern Conference wrap up, playoff Kessel is a whole other animal, and the Penguins are feeling real good about the lineup that they can roll night in and night out. Obviously, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Penguins' goaltending situation. Uh, Matt Murray really locked it down when he came in. Jeff Zatkoff held the fort in this series until they could get Matt Murray back. Huge ups to Jeff Zatkoff. 
it's unfortunate that he'll be the third goaltender, the one who's kind of on the outside looking in once Marc-Andre Fleury is ready to come back. But who knows when that's going to be. For all we know, he's suffered a setback. I don't think anybody is really talking about it. But for all we know, he could have very easily suffered a setback. Pittsburgh wins this series in five games. I took them in seven. I'll take that as a win. I am 2-0 and oh right out the gate. Let's look at Florida and the Islanders. The Islanders winning this series in six games. Now, I took six games, but I took the Panthers to win. So that did not work out for me. The Islanders, super, super impressive. And you can't get closer in a series than this. You really can't. The Islanders scored 15 goals. The Panthers scored 14 over a six game series. Like you can't, you just can't get much closer than that. I guess the big advantage for the Islanders, their special teams did play quite a bit better than the Panthers. 23.8% on the power play versus just 13.3 and 86.7% on the penalty kill versus just 76.2. So special teams were definitely a, a huge difference in this series. The Islanders getting it done. Uh, obviously this series was like basically all offense 39.2 shots per game registered by the Panthers 37.8 for the Islanders so all kinds of offense in this series the goaltenders were another huge story in this one especially Thomas Grice coming into a very difficult situation as the backup goaltender a lot of people wrote his team off when the news broke that Yaroslav Halak would not be ready for this series, most people wrote him off. I know multiple people who, if they were originally predicting the Islanders to win, changed their prediction to the Panthers. Or if they were expecting the Panthers to win, took the Panthers to win in fewer games. Strictly because Thomas Grice was named the starting goaltender. And Grice rubbed it in every single one of their faces. And that is excellent. I mean, that's great for that guy. He just played an unbelievable series. Roberto Luongo, I was very critical of him throughout most of the series. He had his best game in the last game. He faced a ton of puck. He played easily the best game that he played in these playoffs. And it was in a losing effort. And you really can't blame him. You can't hang that loss on Bobby Lou. You really can't. Even though the last goal of the game, he was way out of position. But you can't blame him for that that was just the magic of John Tavares Riley Smith it's unfortunate that his playoff is coming to an end he was dynamite early in this series kind of tailed off towards the end there but he was really dynamite super impressive and John Tavares I mean what do you say what else do you say about the guy that hasn't already been said um early Conn Smythe candidate I think so you could even argue Thomas Grice I think in that position obviously it's way 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 too early to talk about that stuff but I mean there's two real solid contenders for the Islanders from that first round series so I lose that one because I took the Panthers so I'm two and one going into the final series in the Eastern Conference the one that I got the wrongiest of the wrong which was Tampa Bay and Detroit I took Detroit to win this series in seven games this series was barely ever competitive and in doubt That's not to take something away from Detroit, but Tampa Bay just outclassed Detroit in almost every aspect. Tampa Bay wins this series in five games, so I'm 2-2 officially for my first round Eastern Conference predictions. Tampa Bay... Now, it was was a low-scoring series. It was only 12-8. Once Peter Morazic came in, it really got locked down, and Morazic played very well. Ben Bishop played well throughout this entire series, Uh, Tampa Bay, not super impressive on the power play, only 17.4%. That's not bad by any means, but given some of the numbers that we have from some of the other teams, that only ranks 10th out of 16. Now, luckily, they had the best penalty kill of the first round, 96%. Detroit with only a 4% power play in that first round series. Tampa Bay, if there's one thing that they need to be concerned with heading into the second round against an opponent like the Islanders. They need to worry about the number of shots that they gave up. Detroit registered 32 shots a game. Tampa Bay only registered 27.6. So that's something that they are going to have to look out for in the next round. Now, Ben Bishop obviously is equal to the task, but the Islanders are generating a lot of shots. So 
If they can keep the Islanders around that 30, 31, 32 area, I think they'll be in good shape, but we'll save that for the official predictions. For Tampa Bay, obviously Ben Bishop, super impressive, played a very good opening series. Uh, That top line, obviously for Tampa Bay, super, super dangerous. Uh, Jonathan Drouin played a very good series, had that one game with three assists. So he's a guy that they're going to have to really put some defensive pressure on if you're the Islanders. That'll be an interesting one to predict. Uh, I've got to I got to think long and hard about these Eastern Conference matchups. But uh, I ended up going two and two in the Eastern Conference. So what we'll do is my Western Conference wrap up will not occur until, geez, I guess either tomorrow or the next day. I'll have to figure out when will be the best time for scheduling. But again, as I mentioned, tomorrow. We're going to have full-scale round two predictions, even though round one is not done yet, but that's okay. We'll figure that out on tomorrow's episode. All right, folks, that is it for the Tuesday, April 20... What did we say? 26th? Tuesday, April 26th edition of the Bridgewater's Finest 2016 NHL Playoffs podcast. We have no games tonight, so everybody get your rest. Get yourself amped up for the second round. We got our final game of the first round tomorrow... And the first game of the second round tomorrow, I shake my fist in the NHL's general direction for that decision, but I digress. What do you guys think about that? I suppose let me, I suppose I should throw it out to you. What do you guys think about the scheduling? Would you have rather seen like kind of what I said, like they overnight back to Anaheim and play game seven tonight, start the second round on Wednesday? Are you okay with the way they've done the scheduling? Do you think it's fucking stupid like I do? Sorry for the cursing. I will cut that back on tomorrow's episode. My apologies. I'm just frustrated. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and we'll see you again tomorrow for round two predictions.